an improbable repeat birthplace. In image number one, the Majestic Hotel in 1907 with a corner of the Dakota and right foreground. In image number two, photo of May Dara, 1902. In image number three, likeness of Louise Balfe Erlanger from 1889 during her days as an actress on the British stage. In image number four, a recipe for buttermilk bread written on May Dara's office letterhead circa 1905-196. In image number five, the Shaws in 1969. From left to right, Janina, Julie, Molly, Warren. In image number six, Dorothy Wallacek, circa 1967. There is one street in Manhattan that has the unique distinction of having helped birth disability activism in our city not once, but twice, in completely independent episodes that are separated by more than half a century and are remembered by practically no one. That street is West 72nd Street, the place where I was born in 1958 and where my family resided until 1977. Today, it's a busy mixed-use street four blocks long with small 19th century buildings, early and modern apartment buildings, and lots of stores and restaurants. It's an improbable candidate for disability distinction, especially when you consider the street's origins. The bottom layer on West 72nd Street is wealth, big money, as epitomized by its anchor tenant, the Dakota, the Dowager Queen of American Communal Palaces, built in 1880 to 1884 on land bought from August Belmont. By the 1890s, the street was filled with showy row houses and private mansions, each trying to outdo the other. For about 15 years, 72nd Street was the main boulevard in the city's newest place to be, the Upper West Side. In 1894, the Dakota was joined by a massive 600-room hotel right across the street, the Majestic Hotel. It was a fancy place indeed. In Custom of the Country, the novelist Edith Wharton described its charms, lightly fictionalized, as featuring rooms with, quote, wainscoting of highly varnished mahogany, hung with salmon pink damask, and adorned with oval portraits of Marie Antoinette and the Princess de Lamballe. In the center of the florid carpet, a gilt table with a top of Mexican onyx sustained a palm in a gilt basket tied with a pink bow. It was in this building that the improbable became real in the form of a fundraiser run by Louise Balfe Erlanger, the wife of Abraham Erlanger, the most fearsome and feared theatrical producer in the United States. Erlanger was the author of the widely quoted statement, I never trust a man I can't buy. His company discovered such enduring classics as Dracula, Ben-Hur, and the jazz singer, and built the New Amsterdam Theater on 42nd Street. They became millionaires in the process. By 1901, the Erlangers were searching for something to distract from Abraham's ruthless reputation. Ideally, it would be something sufficiently removed from anything theatrical to preclude talk that Abe was being self-serving, yet possess sufficient publicity potential to enable him to be exactly that. It should be a project primarily for his wife. Charitable projects had become quite fashionable among elite New York women, and the Erlangers might earn respectability that way. One of the subjects of the Erlangers' mixed mode of outreach was a woman named May Dara. Dara was born in 1869 in New Jersey. At less than three years old, she was diagnosed with spinal tuberculosis. She was unable to walk unaided until she reached 13, and she retained a hunched posture and diminished height. In 1890, at the age of 20, Dara conducted the first survey of disability in the general population. She later established the nation's first school classes for children with disabilities and raised an endowment sufficient to open the Dara Settlement Home for Crippled Children on West 69th Street, a 20-bed combination school and shelter. In her spare time, she went to medical school and became a doctor. Dara was disabled yet she was far too formidable to be overlooked. A unique figure in the United States, Dara was the first disability activist. 
Maydara was tailor-made for the Erlangers. She had made disabled children an up-and-coming cause, and the appeal of the kids was undeniable. The icing on the cake was Maydara's highly impressive self, while the incredibly convenient location of her settlement home just a couple of blocks from the Erlangers' brownstone on West 70th Street meant an easy visit with other fashionable wives, followed by a no-doubt self-congratulatory tea in the Erlangers' parlor. What could be better? And so it was that May Dara landed her most important backer shortly after New Year's Day 1901. On a Friday afternoon that March, Erlanger threw what she called a charity euchre on behalf of Dara's settlement home, complete, of course, with publicity in the New York Times and elsewhere. The location was the Majestic Hotel at Central Park West and 72nd Street, the most elegant public place on the entire West Side. Erlanger and Dara proved an instant hit. Many more events followed, and Dara plowed the receipts back into her settlement house, which moved to a larger building on West 104th Street. As her budget and her medical practice expanded, Dara set up offices in a ground floor suite in the newly built Severn Apartments at 73rd Street and Amsterdam Avenue, two blocks from the Majestic. Erlanger and Dara only lasted three years. The reasons for the split are far from clear, but after it ended, in the trademark Erlanger style, Louise set out to bury her former benefactee. Stealing Dara's concept and setting up a better funded and better publicized competitor, Mrs. Erlanger began raising funds for her own settlement home, the New York Home for Destitute Crippled Children. Erlanger used the same fundraising and promotional methods as she had for Dara, complete with a kickoff fundraiser at the Majestic Hotel. The new project moved ahead fast, repurposing a brownstone. Mrs. Erlanger had been busy. You could tell from the doorway plaques, which announced that five beds had been endowed by Edward Albee, another four beds by Anna Held. The matron's room came courtesy of Isadora Duncan. Who knew the little children had friends in such high places? But you've got to hand it to Dara, she fought back. She figured prominently, for example, in a nearly full-page spread in the Times about the Children's Aid Society's work on behalf of children with disabilities. Mrs. Erlanger retaliated with a fundraising auction of dolls at the Waldorf Astoria just in time for Christmas. Their competition reached a conclusion in Mrs. Erlanger's favor a few years later when Erlanger held an Actors Field Day fundraiser at the Polo Grounds in Upper Manhattan presided over by George M. Cohan. It drew an audience of 5,000 and raised a small fortune. Amazingly, the Actors Field Day remained a nearly annual New York City event into the 1980s, and probably no one at all remembers its origins in an unlikely rivalry between the nation's first disability activist and the wife of Abraham Erlanger. While the Erlangers slugged it out with Dara, the universe surrounding disabled children in New York City expanded with incredible speed. Thanks to Dara, the cause had won the backing of New York's elite and new organizations multiplied. It was the beginning of the peak in what I've dubbed the Dickensian Disability Movement, a largely private sector effort that was led, especially in its earlier years, mostly by elite college-educated women whose primary cause was what they called crippled children. But Dara would not live to see her efforts fully flower. In 1910, her health broke down and she passed away a few years later age 49. Over her 20-year career, Dr. May Dara achieved success beyond anything she might have reasonably expected, yet she was often minimized. More than one contemporary telling of the Children with Disabilities charity movement states that it was, quote, begun by a woman who was herself a cripple, close quote, but neglects to identify who that person was or recount any portion of her story. The sad outcome is this. My old street's role in the Dickensian disability movement may be forgotten, but May Dara is very likely the single most important person in the history of disability rights in New York City, and she is forgotten too. In the years after Dara's 1910 retirement, West 72nd Street transformed. Half the fancy brownstones were replaced by skyscraping apartments and hotels a dozen stories tall and more, and most of the remaining houses got storefronts grafted onto them. The street turned to carriage trade retail, more downtown than deluxe. The great gangster Arnold Rothstein, who famously fixed the 1919 World Series, 
built himself a hotel across from the Dakota, the Franconia, whose quiet looks disguised that it was perhaps the only place during Prohibition where New Yorkers could drink openly, thanks to Rothstein's generosity with the local police. The fun and game stopped with the crash of 1929. The building boom dried up, the shopping wilted, Rothstein was shot to death, and Prohibition was repealed. For the first time in its 50-year history, my old street experienced a day crescendo, as the nation, the city, and the neighborhood hunkered down for what turned out to be more than a decade of hard times, followed by the Second World War. The voltage continued to slowly drop. Growing up there a few generations later, it sometimes seemed as if time itself had stopped on the west side sometime in the 1940s. During the Depression's housing collapse, many of the West Side's apartments went begging for tenants, and that gave an opening to less well-heeled people. That's when the Upper West Side grew its famously leftist personality. The Radicals' high point probably came in 1944, when the Communist Party opened what it called a School of Social Science at Broadway and 72nd, right across from the old Colonial Club building. The Colonial Club had been home to the most high-nosed moments of the street's best pedigreed days. Despite conversion into offices, its old headquarters remained a monument to the wealthy people who'd once dominated my old neighborhood, but did so no longer. Among the newcomers was an all-female family, a divorced mother with three daughters, which in 1941 moved into a shabby penthouse previously reserved for servants atop a once grand apartment house at 105 West 72nd Street. The youngest daughter, Molly, had a severe case of epilepsy, then a feared and loathed disease. In 1953, Molly became involved with the oddly named New York Variety Club Foundation to Combat Epilepsy, the first ever self-help organization for people then known as epileptics. At a time when going public with epilepsy carried some risk, Molly made an appearance on WEVD radio using her real name on a show known as Science for the People to discuss the disease and the prejudice surrounding it. Not long after, in 1955, she was joined in the penthouse by her soon-to-be husband, Julie, a crutch-using polio survivor who'd been president of a Communist Front political action organization during the 1940s. In 1958, with twins on the way, they anglicized Julie's family name from Shikowitz to the more anodyne Shaw. And it was as Molly and Julie Shaw that they began 72nd Street's second chapter as a birthplace of disability activism. The second chapter began in the early 60s, when Julie and Molly became part of the Handicapped Drivers Association, an activist group that won New York's first ever legal protections for people with mobility impairments and exemption from paying parking meter fees in a campaign that took more than five years. Building and sustaining that effort brought the Shaws into contact with the Ansonia Reform Democratic Club. Conveniently located right across the street, and Sonia provided important resources, in particular, Democratic District Leader Dorothy Wallasek and her husband Paul. Dorothy was a pretty quiet, disciplined person, quite a contrast to my parents' more brash style, but within a short time, the Shaws and the Wallaseks forged a working partnership. It was the 1960s version of Dara and Erlanger, disability activists who had the backing and the networking pull of people in the mainstream. Over the next several years, this partnership helped make free parking at meters a reality. Not long after, on January 24, 1967, came a transformative picket at City Hall protesting a new plan to ease traffic congestion in Midtown by prohibiting parking and towing away all parked cars, including those belonging to people with disabilities. That campaign had truly far-reaching impacts, and much of the planning and execution came out of the second-floor apartment we'd recently moved into, bolstered and amplified by Ansonia and the Wallaseks. Other initiatives included the retrofitting and correction of accessibility problems at then-new Lincoln Center a few blocks away, accessibility-related changes to the city's 1968 building code, and the introduction of a proposed amendment to the state constitution to protect the civil rights of people with disabilities. Dorothy and Julie drafted the amendment, Dorothy introduced it, and Julie testified in favor. This would have been the first constitutional protections for the rights of the disabled in the history of the United States, but the effort did not succeed in New York then or since, though a similar amendment will come up for a statewide vote in November of 2024. 
Shaw Wallasek helped engineer the 1968 creation of the Mayor's Advisory Committee on the Handicapped, the predecessor to the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, or MOPD. They wangled Julia's seat on the new body. That same year, though, the Ansonia Club split over whether to support Lyndon Johnson's re-election as president, among other things. Along with the Wallaceks, the Shaws co-led a revolt by 350 Ansonia members. They briefly set up shop in the old Colonial Club building before moving to 130 West 72nd Street, a second-floor walk-up space above a Chinese restaurant, literally next door to Ansonia. The club's new name was the Lincoln Square Independent Democratic Club, or LSID. It was originally supposed to be Lincoln Square Democrats, but that got changed after someone noticed that the initial spelled LSD. A real no-no in the era of flower power. Shaw Wallasek came to an end in the early 1970s. Dorothy lost an election for state assembly to Dick Gottfried, and the Wallaseks began to phase out of leadership at LSID. In 1972, Julie experienced a health crisis that forced him to largely stop using crutches. He was barely able to get up to LSID's second floor headquarters after that. Nonetheless, my parents continued to produce for the disability community, supporting the upgrading of the Mayor's Advisory Committee into the Mayor's Office for the Handicapped, another step towards MOPD, and waging a long, long campaign to get an elevator installed in City Hall. To me, the City Hall elevator may be the greatest of the Shaw's projects, even beyond the enactment of legislation. The elevator meant actual physical entry to the very seat of municipal power. Instead of being relegated to a little room across the street or making noise protesting outside the city council's windows, the newly organized community would finally have its say like anyone else. On a more somber note, our apartment building had four steps in the outer lobby, and with Julie's new health situation, our lives on 72nd Street acquired an expiration date. In 1977, we moved away to an accessible building in Brooklyn. Julie became the second director of the Mayor's Office of the Handicapped. He served a few years until he retired. As a political duo, the Shaws were done. And so was 72nd Street's second chapter as a birthplace of disability activism. Note, a version of this entry appeared in Able News.